good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all. And uh, to once more gather together as we bring the Lord's Day to a close. Um, it's always a delight. This is like the crescendo. This is the high note that our day ends upon as we prepare ourselves for another work week. Um, this is our second week of our evangelism training. Uh, hopefully you all were here last week and, and that was a blessing to you, what we, what we discussed and what we looked at. I know it was a lot. It was a lot of information. Um, but hopefully it served to encourage you to evangelize, to remind you of the simplicity of evangelism. Um, tonight we're going to look at a, uh, another important topic, and that topic is apologetics. Uh, th- this, is, this is something that's very important. It's something that we all ought to, uh, to be familiar with. Now, apologetics, you say, what does that mean? Is, is it the study of apologizing? Um, because Anna would know that I'm really good at it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yes, my apologies. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, no, it, 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 apologetics is the, the study of the defense of our faith. Uh, in fact, Paul in Philippians 1 uses the term in the defense of the gospel. The word for defense there is apologia. That's where we get the English word for apolo, um, apologetics. And so it is the defense of our faith. So, so what we're going to look at tonight is how to defend our faith. Uh, when we encounter, and we're going to, a lot of... Uh, Questions and comments and challenges from the unbelieving world. Um, and uh, it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate that, that things are like that. Um, but that is the state of the way that things are. And so we need to prepare ourselves for that. So we're actually going to focus our attention primarily on one passage this evening. So it's a little different than last week. We jumped around a lot. So this evening we're going to look in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to start in verse 16. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, to work through a lot more uh, toward the end of the chapter of Romans chapter 1. Now, of course, um, before we get into it, before we look uh, you know, word for word, verse by verse, I'd ask that you go to the Lord with me in prayer, asking that God would bless this time of teaching. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned last week, if you do have a comment or a question midway through, um, you know, please offer that up if you have a thought that you want to convey or... Um, I think at the end last week we, we gave a couple of questions, so I made room for that this evening. So it's a little shorter, so hopefully we'll have a couple of questions. Because I want you to be very specific, too, in your questions. If you have a, uh, a particular comment that someone's even made to you before and you, you, you'd like to know how do I address that, then I want us to look at that as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that he would bless our time together this evening. Father, we thank you for the kindness of your providence that you've ordered it uh, in such a way that we're all here this evening. Uh, that the exact amount of people, that the right people are here at this right time, uh, in, in, within your will. Everything happens according to your will, God. There's nothing that is uh, surprising to you or uh, catches you off your guard, as it were. But we know that you work all things, as Scripture says, uh, for our good and for your glory. Father, I ask that your word, the truth of your word, would penetrate hearts and minds this evening, that we as your people would be equipped to defend the faith. Paul himself said in Philippians 1 that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. And we all, likewise, are appointed not only to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, but we are called upon um, by you to defend that faith that we have in our Lord Jesus. And I pray that each of us, from the least to the greatest, from uh, the youngest to the oldest, would be able to do that, to 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 truly give a, an apology, a, a defense of our of our most blessed faith and our most blessed Lord, and we ask that He is glorified this evening as we look at these things together in Christ's name, Amen, Amen. Um, I've seen this a lot of times in the lives of, of very godly people, even, and it's an unfortunate thing, but it's that there's a lot of Christians that don't know how to defend their faith and almost are. Are, are very scared of the idea of, of doing apologetics, of, of, of trying to, to answer critiques and answer questions from the unbelieving world. I mean, imagine this. Does this thought scare you? If you're in a room full of unbelievers, you know, let's say thousands of people, an audience of thousands of people, and you're, you're put up on a stage, that's probably scary enough for a lot of you, but, but then to be given a mic and then uh, they, they're asked to form a line of all the questions and comments and, and critiques they want to give of Christianity, and then you have the mic and you go back and forth person after person. That's really scary because you can imagine there's, there's, there's a whole plethora, there, there's, an un, uh, you, there, there, there's an infinite amount of questions that can be asked. There's an infinite amount of, well, I don't, why does this verse say this? There's no way the Bible could be true if this verse say, says this or this or that. There's so many ways that, the, uh, that our faith is attacked. It's literally uh, innumerable. We, we can't number it. 
Um, and so that thought begins to creep in and it becomes uh, something that induces fear in us. But guess what? I can say, uh, and I know Travis could with me, um, that because of this method of defending the faith that we're going to look at this evening specifically, that doesn't scare me at all. In fact, I could answer every question. Not actually because I know a lot. I don't know much. But because of the specific apologetic method that we're going we're to study this evening. And it's important that we note that at the beginning. That there are different ways that Christians have approached um, just defending the faith. There's a couple of different methods. The three main ones are what's called classical apologetics. Then there's called evidential apologetics. And then there's called presuppositional apologetics. Presuppositional is a big word, but it merely means to, to presuppose something. Uh, the, the popular uh, method of, of apologetics, of defense of the faith that's used today in churches and in Christian circles, is what we call evidential apologetics. I'll give you an example. I don't believe it comes to you and they say, I don't believe in God. Um, God is not, uh, I don't believe in the Bible. God's not real. I'm an atheist and I don't care about anything I have to say. Why should I believe that uh, your God is a God of glory? The Christian will then reply, if they're an evidential apologist, they'll say, well, if you just look around at, uh, in creation, you see that, uh, that uh, the trees are very intricate in their beauty and, uh, and the stars are so complex and they couldn't have just popped into existence. And guess what? That's a great argument to make. It is. But you know what they've now done? The Christians actually stepped off of something. You know what they stepped off of? They stepped off the word of God. They stepped off of the foundation that we are to stand upon when it comes to defending our faith. Tonight I'm going to present the, the other position that's not that popular, but it is making a, making a resurgence, we could say, in modern day. And it is the historic reform method of defending our faith, and it's called presuppositional apologetics. And here's what presuppositional apologetics is. You can write this down as like a little phrase if you want. It is simply... Standing upon the word of God in defense of the gospel. That's it. That's all it is. You stand upon the word of God and you don't move. Because like I mentioned, a lot of evidential people, when they're presented with that idea, uh, uh, an unbeliever says, I don't believe God is real. They don't go to the Bible. They don't go to the authority of the word of God. They don't go to those things. Instead, they say, well, they use an analogy or they use an illustration. They try to coerce the person into, into believing these things. When rather, we start with the Bible we start with the Bible as our first presupposition. That's why it's called presuppositionalism. We presuppose that the Bible is the very inerrant, inspired Word of God. It's not a question. It's not a question. We don't, we don't work ourselves into believing that. We start as Christians on that foundation. We start on that. And we'll see this play out as I go through this. Uh, you'll see how this works out in conversation with people uh, and in defending your faith. But I want to start here in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, because Paul just so beautifully, um, as it were, describes uh, the issue of unbelief, the issue of unbelief, and, and the nature of unbelief, and what that looks like. But I want to start in verse 16, because he gives his thesis statement for the book. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Verse 17 for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And we know that's what he's going to spend the rest of the book unpacking, is that the gospel is God's saving power unto salvation. It, it is, it is a, the power of God that saves people from their sins. But he starts, of course, and I've mentioned this before, in chapter 1 and verse 18, with uh, declaring to us the bad news of the unbelief of man. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed, is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now I want you to know the end of verse 18, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And this is already uh, something that we need to consider and to take into mind as we conduct apologetics, specifically with the atheist. Because we're going to encounter, you know, the Muslims and, the, uh, and, and, and Jewish people and, uh, and uh, our Mormon and Jehovah's Witness friends. And they believe in a God. They believe in a higher power. But often, especially here in America, it's, it's exploding. Atheism is so popular. And so this is something we're going to encounter. And what does the Bible say about the atheist? It says he knows God exists. It says he, he has knowledge of God. What does it say? Verse 19, God made it evident to them. Verse 21 says they knew God. They have knowledge of God. It's not that they're ignorant of God's, uh, of God's existence. So even right now, guess what we're doing even right now? Presuppositional apologetics because we're starting with the Bible. 
Really, other apologetic methods start with man or start with the unbeliever. And they let them set the tone. You know, an unbeliever comes to you and they say, I don't believe in God. There's no evidence for God's existence. They're lying. They're a liar. It's really an issue of, when it comes to defending our faith, we have to start with this idea of, am I going to believe um, what my own flesh tells me, what the world tells me, what unbelievers tell me, or am I going to believe what God has said about these people and about these situations and about these things? It's really that simple. And we must find ourselves standing upon the Word of God. Otherwise, we have no other foundation upon which to stand. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Paul could have just said they've been seen. He says they've been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And so this answers also for us the question of, you know, I've heard this post to me many times by many different people. You know, what about the person on this island who's never heard about Jesus well, the Bible says what? They know about God. They know who, is, who He is, His character, His attributes, because they're shown in creation. They're evident. And even, well, Scripture goes so far as to say, in verse 21, as I just mentioned, they knew God. There's even a level, uh, you could say, an, 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 an intimacy. There, there's, there's a measure of that. I, I mentioned um, this morning about God being imminent, God being near, the imminency of God. And, and we, can, we can apply that even to the unbeliever. God is near to even the unbeliever. But what happens? Verse 21, They did not honor him as God, nor give thanks. And they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, purity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So really, what's at the heart of, of man's rejection of, of this truth that God exists? You know what really what it is? It's a love for sin. It's a love for idols. It's a love for self. I mentioned that a couple weeks ago. What is it? it what is it? Or, I think it was two, uh, last week. What is the essence of sin? Well, what's the very nature of sin? Self-worship. Selfishness. And man rejects the idea of God's existence. Why are there atheists out there? Really, there's no such thing as atheists. They're just professed atheists. They say they're atheists, but they're not. Why? Because they love their sin. Think about it. If they reject the idea of God, now their conscience, which troubled them, is, is, is appeased. They don't have to worry. I don't, I don't have to worry about you know, living, sleeping with my girlfriend. I don't have to worry about pornography and my drunkenness and my drug abuse. I don't have to worry about these things because God doesn't exist. And I don't have to worry about any sort of, any sort of higher power holding me to any sort of standard. But it says that uh, that truth was implanted within them and they knew God. So keep these things in mind as we deal with um, the, um, specifically the atheists. But uh, these things can apply also to our, to our other religious friends. Because guess what? They know the true God. They know the true God. They know that their God is not the true God. They do. And yet they continue to follow him, these false gods, because they are idols again. It's interesting that Paul there connects at the end that one particular sin, idolatry, with atheism. With the, and not just atheism, but with rejection of the true God. It, it, it's so closely connected, idolatry, with the rejection of the true God that Paul had to mention it there in verses 24 and 25. So, guess what we've already done this, this evening so far, and just in the few minutes we've, 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 we've had together? We've already done presuppositional apologetics. You and I just did it because we started with the Bible. We started with the Bible, and it's the authority upon which we stand in all situations when we deal with the unbeliever. So when someone comes to me with an issue uh, about, uh, about the Bible or about our faith, I don't step off the Bible. You know, the, the, the unbeliever will ask you, why don't you take a, new, a neutral position? Because there's no neutrality with Jesus Christ. You're either for Christ or you are his, his enemy. You're either against Christ or you're for him. There's no in between. We don't stand in the middle and judge. Who, who makes us the judge and arbiter? You know who actually is the judge and the arbiter? God. God is. You know what we do? And this is so sad. It grieves me when a Christians take the evidential approach. When they try to provide evidence to the unbeliever. Or evidence even to the religious, uh, the religious unbeliever. They're really saying, you're the judge, and God's on trial, and I'm trying to make God's case seem appeasing to you. See that? 
See that? It's very, it's very offensive to God. We must do apologetics in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. So you may say, you may ask me, um, when you begin to deal with the unbeliever concerning these things, concerning apologetics, um, what does that look like? What, what, what does it look like if someone comes to you and let's say they ask a question. Uh, we'll, we'll give an example of um, a text in the Old Testament. I, I hear this a lot on the streets. People say, Why, how, could your God come, how could your God command uh, the armies of Israel to go and kill these pagan nations? You know, go and pillage these pagan villages and, and these towns. How could God do that? Now, you are going to be tempted. You and I are going to be tempted to what? Say, well, in the original Hebrew and this and that. And, and well, you know, there, you have to understand this about God. And, and there, there's a place for such a discussion. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm not saying there's no place for even to answer these legitimate questions. Sometimes people come... And they ask out of legitimate concern. But oftentimes, you know what they're actually doing? They're finding, they're trying to find a supposed contradiction or something that appears to be uh, difficult for us to work out. And the, to, to cite that as their reason. To, to say, this is the reason why I don't serve your God. But again, what are they doing? They're putting who? God on trial. They're making themselves up to be the judge. They're making themselves to be God, Really? And so we must not, we're not to play along with the charade. They're, they have a, a charade going on. They're playing pretend, as it were. You know, they're being childish. We're not here to appease that. And so with presuppositional apologetics, again, we presuppose the truth of the Word of God. And really, this is, this is very key, very key. We actually turn it back on to them, really. When you, when you do a presuppositional apologetics... You turn it back on them. So I'll give you an example like with that. Someone asked me, how could God possibly, how could, how could you um, follow a God who would command the Israelites to kill all these people in the Old Testament? That's a legitimate question. And say, it, would you say that's wrong? I would ask him, would you say that that is wrong for God to do that? Would you say that, that that's an issue? he said, say, yeah, it's wrong. That's evil. You know what they've just done? They've appealed to a standard of morality. They've appealed to a standard of morality that they themselves have set. That they're now appealing again, what, to themselves as God. But they're realizing, they're recognizing inadvertently that there is a standard of morality. Because they're holding God to some standard. And it's so unfortunate because they are, again, what are they doing? They're setting themselves up as God. And so we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. We do not want to uh, seek to, to appease that, as it were. And so when it comes to us receiving these comments, these questions, these concerns from the unbeliever... We must protect ourselves from that. And really, there, the, there's really two main things I want to point out when you begin to get in conversation with the unbeliever or the, uh, the atheist or the agnostic. Is you want to point out, uh, you want to show them, when I said turn it back on them, you want to talk about morality and you want to talk about also logic. Those are two main things. So I mentioned, uh, uh, just go back to that example, they say, the God of the Old Testament, he was, he was wrong in doing this. He's wrong in doing this. Again, what are they doing? They're appealing to a standard of morality. It's like me saying this, for example. Uh, is, two, is, is two plus two is four. We all know that, okay? But what if I said two plus two is five? Okay? You said that's wrong. What if I said two plus two is 55? You say that's wrong. Now, I ask you, which one is more right? Which one is more right? Two plus two is 55 or two plus two is five? Two plus two is five. Because it's closer to four. It's closer to four. You know what you're doing? What are you doing? You are appealing to a standard. You're appealing to a standard, that standard of mathematics, that four is the correct answer, and five is closer to the correct answer. And that's what the unbeliever does when they say, God did this wrong. They're appealing to a standard, to a standard of morality. And they're, they're actually confessing through that that, yes, I know right from wrong. Because again, the unbeliever is not ignorant of these facts. They're not ignorant of, right, of, of what is right and what is wrong. They know what's wrong to murder. They know it's wrong to steal. They know it's wrong to lie. You know, it, it, you could even say to the unbeliever, what if I, uh, what if I were to take your, your, your iPhone right now out of your back pocket and run away with it? In your worldview, in the atheistic worldview, there is no God. There is no objective standard of right and wrong. That means nothing. It means nothing to you. Why, why would it mean anything to you? They say, because it's wrong. It's just wrong. I say, because you know God is real. You're appealing to a standard of morality. So again, really, when the unbeliever comes to you, they're going to try to put you in the hot seat. Put them in the hot seat. We're not the ones who have to get, guess what? We're not the ones who have to justify ourselves. We're not. We're not. God has already justified and vindicated himself. 
He, by his own existence, is self-justifying. In fact, there, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to explain himself. He, he's not obligated to do so. And so when the unbeliever steps off of the authority of the Word of God into insanity, there's no other standard, there's no other correct worldview, they have now subjected themselves to, like I said, insanity, and they're the ones who ought to be put in the hot seat. So if an unbeliever says, I believe God did this in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, that was morally wrong. You say, how could you, how could you even believe that? To what standard are you appealing? To what standard of morality are you appealing? You say, well, I just know it's wrong for God to tell the Israelites to kill all those people. Say, how do you know it's wrong? In your worldview, we're, we're merely what? Uh, the popular atheistic worldview is a, 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 an evolutionary worldview. That we're derived from, uh, from basically stardust. We're derived from a, a primordial, primordial soup. We're, we, we have no inherent value. And the world, all creation has no, no, no eventual end. There, it's meaningless. And really, it's like an extreme view uh, that King Solomon had in Ecclesiastes. All is vanity, except really far <laughs> to the end that really all is vanity. Everything in their mind is, 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 is deprived of meaning. And so we need to put them in the hot seat because now they're trying to act like something has meaning. Now they're trying to say something that morality means something. That it means something if you, if you take from somebody else, if you steal from somebody else. You can ask them, well, do you believe murder is wrong? Do you believe someone kills somebody is wrong? Say, why? Yes. Well, why? Why? You say, because you know that God exists. Put them in the hot seat. Do not, because again, we often put ourselves on the offensive, or excuse me, on the defensive. Go, go on the offensive. When you're, when you're uh, doing apologetics, you must go on the offensive and fight back. We again, remember, God does not, God does not need justification. In fact, we find all throughout Scripture, who's in need of justification? It's man. In the objective sense, he needs Christ's salvation. The unbeliever needs to be justified. They need to be, they need to be altered. They don't need to be explained into things. They don't need us to, uh, to try and, and, and paint God in such a way that, oh, finally they'll receive him. Because guess what? If you can explain them into belief in God, someone else can explain them out of it. If you can explain the unbeliever into believing in God, someone will come along who's smarter than you, and there's many people who are smarter than you and I. They can explain them out of it. We don't, we don't approach it that way. Instead, we call them out for their sin. For their sin. This isn't an intellectual issue. Remember that. This isn't, this isn't for the unbeliever, specifically for the atheist, and, and, and for the religious unbeliever. This is not an issue of the intellect. This is not an issue of the wits. This is not an issue of who has a better argument. It's an issue of sin. That's why I said put them in the hot seat. Because it's ultimately, and again, you're not here to win an argument. You're here to win a soul. You're here to win a soul. You're pursuing someone's soul that they themselves might be saved. Their unbelief is not a, is not a byproduct of the fact that uh, they had a smart college professor who had all these great arguments. It's a, it's, it's a byproduct of the fact that they hate God and they want nothing to do with Him. But you call them. Call them into His marvelous light. Call Him. Uh, call them unto salvation in Christ. Call them to turn from their sins. To, to turn from suppression that's what they're in right now. They're in a state of, of, of suppression of truth. That's why he says there in verse 18 at the end that the righteousness of God, or excuse me, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, in their love for their sin. So that's an, that, that would be an example of a, of a moral argument being offered. You can also say... Um, and this is one that's brought to my attention all the time. Is someone will say, um, you know, the God of, of glory, the God of Scripture um, that, you, that you talk about and you, you reference. I read the Bible, but I find many contradictions. It, it seems illogical that the Bible would say one thing here and one thing there. Now, again, what's the evidential approach? Well, you know, Paul and James were meaning this and that, and they were talking to different audiences. And, you know, the Greek word here can mean that. And, you know, there's a Bible commentary that mentions this. That's, that's all great, but that's for a different conversation. Really, that's for a conversation with someone who is a believer. Because those are things that, yeah, we can discuss, we can talk about. But for them, it's actually, you know what they're doing? What again are they doing? They're appealing to a standard of logic. They're appealing to a standard of logic. Saying, uh, basically, uh, that uh, you know, two plus two can't be five. It's illogical. You know, if I have two fingers here, two fingers here, I have four fingers if I, if I say I have five fingers, I'm, I'm, I'm going against logic. And here's what's so beautiful about logic 
and you'll get a lot of unbelievers to admit this to you, the, the laws of logic are, are immaterial. They're not written down somewhere. They're immaterial. They have no material uh, state, you could say. They're eternal. In other words, they don't change. It wasn't like yesterday, <coughs> 2 plus 2 was 5. Tomorrow it'll be 2 plus 2 is 6. It's always been the same. And um, that right there shows us what? And, and also we can even add they're unchangeable. They're unchangeable. They, they will not alter. And what does that show us? These rules of logic come from somebody. They come from God. They come from the God of glory. So again, the unbeliever comes to you and they say that, you know, say, oh, all these contradictions in the Bible. In your worldview, logic doesn't even exist. You know, you could say the cat flies south pizza. I mean, it, it, in your worldview, that makes sense. It don't, I don't have to make sense. In fact, you could even, listen, sometimes it's funny just to do this to the unbeliever to show them how ridiculous their worldview is. Say, okay, in that case, do, do, do my, all my responses to you as we continue to converse, do they need to be logical? Do they need to be in accordance with the laws of logic? Do they need to be moral? Do they need to be respectful? They say yes. And you, you say, why? In your worldview, those things don't exist. And so then you could just start making up a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And just You can talk like Anna. And they'll think, <laughs> they'll think, they'll think, that, I, I kid, I kid. Anna's brilliant. Um, especially with jokes. So, um, and you can show them what? And what, what are they going to say? They're saying, that's ridiculous. Again, what are they, what are they, appe they're appealing to something. They're appealing to something, uh, a standard of what is ridiculous and what is not ridiculous. And so that's really unfortunate. Really it is. So, again, point that out to them. Show them that. And ultimately do it with love. Because, again, th this apologetic method is destructive. It's like a hammer. It, it shatters people's worldviews. shatters people's egos. And we're not here, to, we're not here to, to puff ourselves up and win arguments. We're here to win souls. Say it with love. With love. True compassion for people. That, that, you are not, uh, that you are not out to, to win an argument. You're really not. You're out to win a soul. Scripture says he who is wise wins souls. It's Proverbs 11.30. It's not he who is wise wins arguments. He who is wise speaks eloquently. It's he who is wise wins souls. And so as you deal with the unbeliever, put them in the hot seat, yes. Uh, go on the offensive. Challenge. Again, presuppositionalism is we are standing upon our presupposition, but also you are challenging their presupposition. Every question the unbeliever comes to you with, every concern they come to you with, it is built off of a presupposition. And in the, in, in the worldview of the unbeliever, there is no presupposition. They can't have a presupposition. They can't stand upon anything. They have no standard. You don't have to memorize half the Old Testament and all the different difficult verses that people point out to you. You don't have to memorize uh, Greek words and Hebrew words to be able to defend your faith. All you have to do is know how to challenge their presupposition. Because guess what? If it's an issue of who knows the most Greek words, who knows the most Bible verses, we're all losing. If we go uh, to a seminary and we start de debating some professors who know how to sight read Greek and Hebrew, who know the Bible better than I do, but are going to hell. And they don't believe in the God of glory. They don't truly believe in the God, the God of Scripture. It, it, it's not, that's not what it is an issue of. It's, again, challenging their presupposition. Because they have presuppositions. Do you know, an unbeliever gets in their car every day and they start it, expecting it to work. And they go to work and they expect to come home. You know, all of that is banking on the providence of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the consistency of the laws of nature, the consistency of logic. The consistency of morality. All these things are bank. You know, it's funny because um, I mentioned before, worry is like practical atheism. But I would say sometimes atheists, all the time, atheists are acting like religious people. In the sense that they're, they're, they're living their lives in such a way that they with confidence do all these things that they do. And they shouldn't have any confidence to do anything. And that's another thing uh, that you can challenge is uh, we call this uh, the uniformity of nature. It's an idea where um, the, the laws of nature, for example, like the laws of thermodynamics, they cannot be changed. They cannot be altered. They likewise are immaterial, eternal, and unchangeable, very much like the character of God. It's interesting because those things might, they might come from the character of God. That's right, because this creation reflects the beauty of God's character. And, um, and I wish I knew more of, of natural sciences and things of the like and, and those things and how they work in their intricacies. Um, and I, therefore, I could probably go into a further detail. But it's wonderful to consider that. These things derive from God's character. So, you know, an unbeliever, they get in their car, and there, there are some chemical processes that take place, you know, when they turn that key over. 
They're banking on the fact that uh, God is upholding all the laws of nature, all the laws uh, that those chemicals in their reactions abide by, in those milliseconds as, as the key goes over. They're banking on the fact that that's going to happen this morning, just like it did the morning before, and the morning before, and the morning before. That's faith in God. That's faith in the fact that this world's not chaotic, actually. It is, it is corrupted by sin. It's not chaotic, though. Every molecule in this universe is being ruled by divine sovereignty. And God has certain laws in place uh, that, that by which the cosmos uh, themselves, down to the molecular level, are guided and, and, and controlled and directed. And they're not, they're not changed and altered. So point that out to the atheists. Say, how can you get in your car and trust that it's not going to explode? You're trusting in the fact that God upholds his natural creation. So those three things, like I mentioned, morality. Challenge their presuppositions on morality. Challenge their presuppositions on the laws of logic. And challenge their presuppositions on the uniformity of nature. Those are really the three main things that you can challenge them on. And take them to town on. Just pound it out. And, and go until they realize their worldview is insanity. You don't have, and it's amazing because then you're like, I don't have to memorize everything. I don't have to memorize all these questions. I remember when I first became a believer, I'm thinking... I'm so scared because I was so passionate about evangelism. I was doing a lot of evangelism, handing out tracts and this and that. And I had very, pas- very passionate, but I knew very little, very little of the Bible and Scripture. And I was scared because I thought, if I'm going to run into somebody and they're going to ask me a question, I'm not going to know. You don't have to know. Because, again, we're not the ones who have to justify our worldview. They're the ones. They're the ones who have to justify their worldview. And even as we think about our, our religious friends who don't believe in, in our God. Again, we start with our presupposition. What's our presupposition? The Bible's true. Because what the Bible says, their God's an idol. That's the end of the story. It's not, okay, let's take an objective view. Let's see whose God is more consistent. No, absolutely not. Our God is the true God. There, there, there is no other God. There, there, there is absolutely no other option. And then we challenge their presuppositions. And we could go into a whole discussion on how would you would challenge the, the religious unbeliever. But again, remember, stand upon the Word of God. Do not abandon it. If you, if you do so, you're going to fail. You're going to miserably fail in conversation. And you'll, make, you'll just make yourself look like a fool. And that's not, that's not what we want. We, we certainly don't want that. In fact, uh, Psalm 96, verse 5, if you want to turn there, is a wonderful verse when you deal with the, the religious unbeliever. Psalm 96, verse 5. I'll actually start in verse 1. I just love, I like to do that a lot of times just to give a context, just to give us an idea of what, what, what the, tone, the tone of the, ver, the, the passage is. Psalm 96, verse 1. Psalmist writes, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly, to be, uh, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Verse 5. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. That's all we need. That's our presupposition. You may say, well, don't you need to compare God and Allah? Or don't you need to look at the historicity of uh, of the Quran with the historicity of the Bible and see which one, you know, weighs up, which one's more. No, because my presupposition is the Word of God, is the Scriptures, and I'm not going to step off of it. I'm not going to step off of it. So even as we're engaging the religious unbeliever, we start with our presupposition and we challenge their presupposition. We challenge their worldview. And we call them to believe, repent and to believe upon our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what an offense. What an offense. That, uh, could, uh, you men who are married, I can, I can appeal to that. You men who are married, could someone convince you to engage in the conversation with them, debating with them whether or not your wife exists, and you taking a neutral position? Could you? No. Why? You're convinced she exists, right? You're convinced of it. You're, you're pretty, pretty firm in your foundation on that. And it's likewise with our Lord. We are the bride of Christ. You wives, could anyone convince you to, uh, to, to enter into a debate with them about whether your husband exists and you take a neutral position and try to compare the, the different ideas? No. Because you're convinced. We're the bride of Christ, brethren. It's an offense to our bridegroom to uh, assume a position of, well, you know what, let me consider, you know, you know maybe let's look at, no, let's not, because you're, you're an error. You're the one who's an error. It's not arrogance. It's not saying I'm right. It's saying God's right. 
It's, it's not saying I, I'm smart and I have everything figured out. You, you don't go about it like that. I, I, in fact, it's really saying I, I don't know everything, but the Word of God knows all that I has everything I need to know. The God of glory, the God of all creation, is the judge. He himself is not being judged. He's not on trial. You are. And we're, we're merely, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. As we defend the faith, God is using us to, uh, to appeal to the unbelieving world concerning our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, let us remember this method. Let us use this method. And I can tell you that the Lord has greatly used it in my own evangelism ministry. I've had some wonderful conversations with, with very nice people who are atheists. I've challenged their presupposition. Challenge how they could possibly, how could an atheist even walk down the street? If I was an atheist, I would be utterly terrified. Would you not? You're not promised that the gravel or the, the, the pavement on your feet is going to hold up. You're not promised anything. It's all chaos. It's all insanity. There's no, more, there's no objective standard of morality. It's really not objectively wrong if someone just came up and shot me. I don't know whether even it's, Ill, it's illogical to walk down the street. Because in my worldview, none of that exists. I mean, it, it, it really, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It is insanity. It's laughable. You know, I mentioned earlier about you taking their position for a moment just to show them how stupid it is. Do it because it's funny. And they might even chuckle. You know, you say, oh, well, in your worldview, there's no such thing as logic. So the cat flies south at pizza. That doesn't mean anything. It's illogical. And they'll say, you're just being ridiculous. Say, I'm just being what your worldview would be. I'm just I'm I'm drawing out the conclusions of your worldview. I'm just I'm just I'm just applying it. I'm being consistent. You know, and they, they say, well the Bible has to be consistent in order for it to be true. You're thinking, <laughs> you're the one who's being inconsistent. So again, go on the offensive, be aggressive. And uh, you'll find that uh, this method of apologetics is uh, is the correct method. Do you know why? Because it's a biblical method. We just saw that in Romans 1. Paul doesn't no, Paul doesn't seek to to put the unbelievers in God kind of on these equal sides and say, all right, let's just figure out who's... He says, God has revealed himself. God is in the right. Man is in the wrong. His rejection of God is not based off of ignorance. It's based off of love for sin and hatred for God. And man is the one that needs to be justified. And he spends the rest of the book of Romans saying, here's how man is justified. It's through what? The work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible never even seeks to explain the existence of God in the sense of, it doesn't start out um, with the atheistic worldview. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There it is. It assumes. It presupposes. You know why? Because it later declares, as we just saw in Romans 1, that he exists. That he's real. And all people know him. They know him. They know who he is. I had a discussion just last night at the store at Walmart uh, with one of my, co my former co-workers. And we were talking and I knew that, I suspected she was a Jehovah's Witness because I noticed the one, one the way she dressed, because Jehovah's Witnesses are very, very clean, well-dressed people, very friendly, very nice people, some of the nicest people you'll meet, very hospitable. Um, and uh, I invited her, actually. I was going to, I was about to invite her because she said she's not doing anything for Thanksgiving. And I said, well, I, I'm pastoring a church and I'd love to, and she began to share with me the fact that she was a Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness, and Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in celebrating any sort of holidays outside of what's specifically prescribed in Scripture. They don't believe in celebrating birthdays. And so I understood then, and I wasn't going to go further with the invitation because she would not have come. But we got into a discussion about uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe he's to be worshipped as God. And um, you know what? This woman, though she's a nice lady, she's very friendly. She knows that Christ is God. She knows he is the God of glory. But um, because of her love for sin, she rejects him. And she, by rejecting the Son, who does she also reject? The Father and the Spirit. She rejects the true God. So it's not an issue again. And even last night, I didn't approach it with her from a neutral standpoint. It's an affront. It's an offense to Christ. It's sin. I'd say it's a sin to approach it from a neutral standpoint. Because there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. So, um, and the discussion went, went relatively well. And I wish it, we had more time um, to discuss those things. But certainly solicit your prayers on her behalf. Um, 
But remember that. Again, even her. I kept that in mind. She is not neutral, and I'm not going to be neutral. She's in rebellion to God, and she must repent lest she perish. And you know what? There's a sense even with the atheists, you, you might even garner their respect. A lot of time you'll actually just offend them because this is a very hard, it, it, it's a hammer, like I said. And you might, you'll get a lot of people upset. But if you say it with love and grace, it becomes, it, it's more smooth. It goes down smoother. But um, you might also, and I've had this a couple times, people, you'll garner their respect because they'll realize they're convicted on their worldview. Because we, especially in America, it's, we're so seeker friendly. We're, we're just, we have to be so soft. We have to be so, so feminine. We have to be so easy on everything. You know, we just want to woo everybody into our church. And we don't want to say anything offensive. We don't want to upset you. You know, God forbid that we would trigger you snowflakes, you know, that we would, that we would upset you, right? That's just so weak. But our God's not a weak God. Our God's a strong God. The gospel's powerful. Paul says it's dunamis. It's, that's where we get the word dynamite. It's pretty, it's pretty radical. Our faith is pretty radical. The truth of the gospel is pretty radical. And when we go out in the world, when we defend our faith, when we make an apologia of our faith, it's going to be offensive. It's going to be strong. But you, like I said, you might. If they're, if, if they're somewhat level-headed, they'll, they'll probably respect you. Because they'll say, they're not, they're not stepping down. They're convinced. This God that they serve, he's the true God. He is. This is a wonderful testimony. This is a wonderful testimony of the unbelieving world. Of the truth of these of these things. I think there's one more passage I want to look at very briefly. More of a, just an encouragement to you, and, and uh, another passage in Psalm Psalm 19. Like I said, more of a we won't go too deep into it, but it's a beautiful beautiful passage. Mm-hmm. Psalm 19:1. You're probably familiar with this. Um, it's Psalm of David. David here, Israel's greatest king, earthly king that is. Um, chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. He says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. I like the New American Standard for a million reasons, and this is one of them, that the present participle is here. You know, some, some translations say declaring, uh, which is good, but I like are telling because it's, like I said, it's pre- it, it gives the idea that there's a perpetual action going on here. All, all creation, not just the heavens, so we can draw this out by implication, that it's every, every aspect of God's created world, everything, is telling, is proclaiming the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And if you recall, I've mentioned this before, the, the Hebrew word for glory is kabod. That's weightiness. So weightiness. There's a sense in which all creation has a weight upon it, bearing down, and that's God's glory. It's God's glory. Um, and we can even bring this down to DNA, you know, and, and, and matters of, of that, and, and, um, and, and, and then draw it out again to, to just the grandeur of the cosmos, the actual size of the observable universe, and 93.4 billion light years across, you know. It's just so massive. Um, but remember that. Remember that. All things declare the, the glory of God, and all people are aware of the glory of God and His attributes and who He is uh, in His essence. So, so that's what we've seen here in Romans 1, a couple of passages in Psalms, is this presuppositional apologetic um, that we are to stand upon the Bible as our presupposition, and we are then to take with the unbeliever the offensive and attack there. We are, we're to viciously attack their presupposition. Not them, their presupposition. Because they're always presuppos- They're always stealing from our worldview. That's one way you can look at it. They're always just stealing from us. You know, when they say, oh, your God did this evil thing, they're just stealing from our morality. They're just stealing from our code of morality. Where they say, oh, these Bible contradictions, they're just illogical. Our God is logical. The truth of Scripture is logical. They're stealing from us again. They say, give that back. That's mine. That's my worldview. Put that down. That's not yours. Until you repent and believe, that's not yours. You're, you're reduced to absurdity. You're reduced to a worldview of insanity. Where nothing means, uh, where everything means nothing. Nothing means everything. That it makes sense. It's not supposed to. It, it, it is, it, that's what you have left. So we ought to really, we're claiming back our own, uh, pieces of our worldview they keep stealing from us. And they must to function. They're going to function in society. On a very basic level, they have to stand upon a Christian worldview. They say, oh no, I got that from, I got that from Islam. I got that, you know, code. No, they stole from us. Because again, what? All the gods of people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So let's keep these things in mind. Um, 
And uh, so that's what we've seen here. And let us, let us glorify God that it's, it's ordered in such a way as this. That he is the true God. He is the judge. We are on trial. And those of us who are in Christ, guess what? The verdict has been passed. We're not guilty. We are justified. Um, it's been said before, justified can, you could say, justice, just if I'd never sinned. Um, you know, and that's kind of corny, but it, it is true. We are seen by God as righteous in Christ, those of us who are in him. Because he died for sinners. He died upon Calvary's cross to purchase redemption. He rose again and he is alive today. And all who believe upon him are saved to his glory. And that's the end of it, is the glory of God. As we saw there in Psalm 19.1, it, all creation is telling of the kabod, the weightiness of God's glory. Um, before we close in a, in a word of prayer, I thought it was good last week that we had a moment for questions, comments. Is there... Is there anything I know? Sometimes I, I get I get in a certain manner of speech where I just keep going on and on and on, and, and it feels kind of unnatural to insert something, to insert something. So, does anybody have a question or something they'd like to mention? There are several things that I because 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 presuppositional apologetics have been very helpful to me as well. Um, I I fell into the evidential when I was coming through college and. This gets to a debate about evidences. But I don't necessarily think think the evidential apologetics initially all the way bad. I think you don't let it need to be the marrow of mm. your presentation and let evidences sort of be like the seasoning, mm. salts and spices that go across the top of the meal when you present the gospel uh, to them. Um, but there is a passage that 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 that, that deals that deals with the presuppositional apologetics, which is first Peter chapter one, verse fifteen. It says, but, but sanctify the Lord, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. And the whole thing there is sanctify the Lord or set apart the Lord. Um, I think it's key there. When you go into the debates, you're not just arguing that Christ is the only Savior. You're also arguing that He is Lord. Okay? In the same way that He has changed our hearts. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that we, we see him as Lord, we worship him as Lord, likewise when we go into the debate, he is the Lord. And when you go into the arguments with people in the debates, there, 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 there is no neutrality, like, like, like Lucas was saying. Um, I guess uh, our, our, our country, our, our nation is all about the freedom of religion. And if we take that too far as Christians, if we take that and with it too far, um, we make all the religions equal. But they're not. They're, they're not at all. And what's happened, I think, a lot of Christians, as we go into this room with all the other religions of America or the world, and we want to just sit down at the table with them and have a discussion. No, no, no. Once you pull up the chair and have a discussion with them, you're equal to the table. Okay? And so Jesus is just one of the other idols in the room. That they bring to the table. But it's not that you pull up to the table, you bring the sword of the Spirit. And you drive it through the middle of the table, and, but the idols fly where they may. <laughs> um, but it, like I said, that's very confrontational um, when you do that. So, but, 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 but just realize that you carry the sword of the Spirit, not the sword of just another religion. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you carry the sword of the spirit, and you can do it in love. Like, you can, like I mean, I mean, talking to, 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 to the lady there at Walmart and um, such thing as that. But when you share the gospel, you are setting apart Christ as Lord. He has set you apart as His child. He's adopted you, and you belong to Him. You're His bride. Okay, um, and don't apologize for that. Right, um, but. Uh, but that's why it's always been helpful to me. Um, and then in Romans chapter 1, it says that they suppress the truth and believe the lie, which I thought was previously before, but the lie goes back to the Garden of Eden where Eve believed that she could be like God. Mm. And that's the lie that all the religions teach. Even the atheist is religion unto themselves. They believe they can be like God. Uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, all of the religions 
believe that they can be like God. They can become a God. Um, and so when you go into their conversation, you set apart Christ as Lord. Right? You're knocking down their idol, like he's saying. You're knocking down their idol of themselves and their heart. Um, so, um, and it says, uh, Psalm 14 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Um, so the issue is their heart. It's not necessarily their mind. I mean, uh, they give the mental arguments. They say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, they give that argument because of their hearts. Yes. They've hardened their hearts against God. Now, if God comes in and changes their hearts, then they begin to set apart Christ as Lord in their mind. And until their hearts are changed, they'll present you any kind of argument. <laughs> and but you can't get into the misleading of the faith. I'm sorry if I no beautifully said. Like too much, but it's, it's it's been very liberating to me um, as far as sharing the gospel with the presuppositional apologetics. Because I felt like I was sort of in bondage with evidential uh, when I walked into a conversation with somebody. Because if I just didn't give them the right answer, uh, I was done for. Like. Yes. You know, just the right evidence is you might as well just go home and lock the door <laughs> and never come back out again. You know. Um, but presuppositional, you realize that Christ is Lord. You do not give it up on the conversation. You do not give any of that. Um, or you give that ground, I guess you say. Yeah. In the conversation. Um, but I use arguments like that. People say, well, I don't believe in God. I said, well, why do you say GD would? Why do you say GD? Why do you just curse God? Or why do you ask God to damn yourself? I mean, why, why, why did you do that if you don't believe in God? So even their language, like I said, their language is either religious or ir irreligious. Um, but they know there's a God. They know there's a God. And they know the true God. It's just they reject them. They use their language against them, like he's saying. It's, it's a, atheists are very religious. They just don't want to know that they're religious. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Two things I want to add to what you said. Just for clarification, I mentioned, I, I came hard pretty, I came very hard, um, came down very hard on evidential apologetics. I do want to clarify, like Travis mentioned, I, I said it briefly. It is appropriate at the right time to use, and I use it. And sometimes an unbeliever comes, and they're really asking me, truly asking. It's not really out of a out of an ill intent. They're they're really curious about a Bible verse. You know, and just how did this happen in the Old Testament? Or, you know, Paul said this. How could you know? How do I reconcile it? Answer it. Answer the question. That's why we do need to study. We need to know these questions, these common objections, and these things like that. And like the lady last night, we we were discussing Bible verses about the deity of Christ. You know, so and we were using evidences. Um, but like you mentioned, it's the marrow. Presuppositional should be the, the essence of our apologetic. That, that's what we primarily go to. And then later on, once, you, once, you've, once you've established uh, the Christian worldview, or I should say once you've established the absurdity, absurdity of their worldview, that um, they have nothing to stand upon, they admit it and they see it, then you can say, well, I mean, I can answer your questions now. Because now we've established my worldview is the only one, the right one. The, the, the biblical worldview is the only true worldview. You can't have logic, morality, uh, the, the laws of nature without God. You cannot have these things without God that you, that you constantly rely upon and you live in accordance with and you obey. You can't have them without God. So you are acting with knowledge concerning God, out of knowledge of, of, the, of the true God. So, and you can say, yeah, now that we've established that, let's, uh, and, and by that point the world is destroyed, but they might still have a couple questions that they want to... So yeah, definitely. I, and even with Christians, it's great for a Christian. I mean, you, you know... All the time, I'm, when I'm preaching, I'm, I'm talking about common objections about a verse. We're doing evidential apologetics all the time. But when we, specifically when we deal with the unbeliever, we need to really primarily push presupposition, challenge their presupposition, and stand upon ours. So. And then the other thing I, you mentioned was um, sanctifying Christ as Lord. And I think it's just so good. You keep that at the forefront. Jesus is Lord. Their God is not. Their, what they believe is not true. So... Anything else? All right. Well, I think this uh, went really well, and I appreciate you guys coming this evening. And um, you know.
you know, uh, hopefully this has encouraged you. Like Travis mentioned, this is, there's a liberating aspect to this. That it does, it's not all on your shoulders. It's on their shoulders. It's on the objector's shoulders, the unbeliever's shoulders. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, as we, as we close out our time together this evening. Father, we repent of our sin. Uh, we repent of our, um, our pride and our rudeness. I know that I've been rude to unbelievers before. Um, and even the times that we're rude to other believers or other people, just in a general sense, even small ways, that's a grievous sin against you, God. We, may we be convicted of it. May we can be convicted of those things in our lives. We confess our sin before you, Father, even the ones that we are unaware of. We, we ask that your spirit would bring those things to our attention, that we might confess them specifically and receive that forgiveness from you that you freely offer because of what Christ has done. I pray that this evening, um, if there's anyone here who's not a believer, that they would turn from insanity, they would turn from, they would turn from um, just a, a worldview that is destructive and ungodly and will destroy their soul. I pray they would turn to Christ and live. They would turn to the Lord, the one true Lord. I pray for those of us who are in Christ, who are under his lordship. May we walk in accordance with that. May we sanctify him as Lord, for he is, and there is none other. There is no other God but the Lord. Who, well, I love that, that text out of the Old Testament. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, O Lord? That you are awesome in power, you're majestic in holiness. There is no God but the Lord. In fact, we could say with the psalmists, they are all idols. And we rejoice knowing that you are God and that you are for us, you are for your people. And so we ask that you are glorified tonight and forevermore. Amen.